everyone, this is Richard with the Modern Health Span newsletter. First, a disclaimer. In this newsletter series, we will share the latest research studies, news and events that we found interesting. It is not a recommendation or medical advice. First, we would like to give a shout out to our supporters who are very generous to buy us some coffees. It encourages us to continue to share information on ageing research. Thank you so much for your support. The purpose behind our first paper is to look for a set of biomarkers to tell people's health and longevity status through tests which do not require taking biopsies or even blood samples. Rather they want to do it with smell by analysing volatile organic compounds or VOCs. In the paper they looked at whether they can use VOCs to tell centenarians and their offspring from age match controls. Aging is characterised by changes in our metabolism. Biomarkers that let us discriminate people of different age and health status have attracted great interest, so the authors looked at whether there was metabolome markers that would also serve this purpose. And in particular, they looked at volatile organic compounds, which have not been much studied at this point. One advantage of these is that they could be measured potentially in the air. Therefore, they investigated the profile of VOCs from urine and feces of 73 volunteers of different ages, including centenarians, who would act as supercontrols with the aim of identifying biomarkers of successful aging and longevity. What they found was that the profiles can discriminate different age groups and also centenarian offspring from those of age match controls. And in particular, they were able to show similarities between centenarians and their offspring, which was different from that from the offspring spouse, where similarity would probably be environmental. Here we can see the results in a Venn diagram, showing the different compounds in the different sections. Here, cent is centenarian, eco is an offspring of a centenarian, ec are elderly controls, and y are young. The study is interesting as it opens up another possible set of biomarkers for looking at age and health, as well as possibly providing another avenue of study as to why centenarians live longer and what is special about their metabolism. The next paper is looking at a new way of making something that looks like a blastocyst by reprogramming skin cells into eye blastoids. When studying early development of a human embryo, there are ethical considerations with using a blastocyst, as this is the early group of cells which can go on to form an embryo, and so a human. Pluripotent stem cells and trophoblast stem cells have been used for this, where a trophoblast is the outer layer of a blastocyst, which goes on to form the placenta. However, these are generally too simple to model the complexity of the blastocyst. What the authors did was to create an in vitro three-dimensional model of a blastocyst by reprogramming skin cells, which they called an eye blastoid. The eye blastoid had many of the features and structures of a blastocyst and was capable of modeling in vitro several aspects of early stage development. In summary, they created a scalable way of looking at early human development for testing the effects of gene mutations and toxins as well as in vitro fertilization. It should be noted that the eye blastoid is not a perfect match for a blastocyte. It does not have the zona pellucida shown here and does not have the ability to grow into an embryo. But the idea is that the eye blastoid will provide a way to perform initial tests and then only the most promising treatments need to be reviewed with a true blastocyst. Very interesting, and another use of cellular reprogramming. Our third paper today looks at whether it is possible to overtrain on HIT and what the effect is on mitochondrial performance and glucose tolerance. Exercise is known to improve metabolic health by increased mitochondrial capacity and improved glucose regulation. It's a great way to reduce the chances of metabolic disease. And within exercise in general, High intensity interval training has been shown to provide an effective and efficient way to improve these and other health markers. However, the upper limit of HIT exercise associated with beneficial effects has not been identified. A cohort of 11 healthy adults who exercised but were not professional athletes took part in the study. They were given a progressively increasing exercise load over a period of four weeks. The tests were done in the lab and involved using a stationary bicycle. During this time, they closely followed the changes in glucose tolerance, mitochondrial function and dynamics, physical exercise capacity and whole body metabolism. 
Following the week, with the highest low, they found a striking reduction in mitochondrial function and a disturbance in the glucose tolerance. They also looked at the continuous blood glucose profiles in world-class endurance athletes and found that they had impaired glucose control compared with matched controls. Here is what they saw diagrammatically. The initial exercise load was five four-minute intervals with three minutes rest but twice per week. The next week was three sessions with some of the exercise periods increased to eight minutes. Then week three was five days in the week with the same mix of four and eight minute sessions. Finally in week four the intensity was halved. Things looked good up to week three when the researchers saw a sudden decline in mitochondrial performance as well as blood sugar control. Even during week four where there was some room for recovery, the participants still saw a 24% drop from their peak. Though the athletic performance returned, as we can see in the graphs, mitochondrial respiration and glucose tolerance did not. This underlines that being fit and being healthy are not necessarily the same thing, and you can overdo your hit. Next our event corner. From May 3rd to the 9th, there is a chronic inflammation summit which will be hosted by Dr. David Jokers which discusses strategies to address chronic inflammation and the conditions associated with it. This online event is free but you need to register first. The registration link is in the description. Next, the Healthy Longevity webinar series hosted by Professor Brian Kennedy. The topic of the April the 8th webinar is Interventions in Premature Aging presented by Professor Morten Skibi Knudsen from the University of Copenhagen, in which he shares insights about DNA damage and maintenance and its role in longevity. I hope you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and will speak to you again soon.